It is my great, great pleasure to welcome tonight the uh, Rochester-based mystery author, Charles Benoit. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. He is ex-military. He's also worked at a high school. He can tell you which one is worse. <laughs> He's published uh, three mystery novels so far, which have been called the type of thing that Alfred Hitchcock would film. Uh, the last two novels here uh, are out of order, set in India, and Noble Eyes set in a post-tsunami uh, time. Um, his uh, next book coming out is going to be uh, called You. It's coming out in October, so you won't be able to buy that yet. You might be able to pre-order from Amazon. I'm not sure how far That's I can do that. Um, but he's here to talk about uh, his own noir writing style as well as his knowledge and influence uh, from film noir. So please welcome Charles B. And I had to write down my answers. <laughs> hope, I hope one of the answers is seven, because I'm ready. <laughs> I'm going to start off by ignoring the inevitable and unanswerable question of what is noir, and focus on something a little more personal. What do you look for in noir when you are searching for noir? I'm glad you decided not to get into the debate of what is noir because we've gone back and forth in email and email and over beers debating this and it would just get into this big drunken brawl and you don't want to be involved. Uh, when it comes to noir that I like to either read or I like to watch, the darker the better and I don't like the, the happy endings. Uh, the film we're going to see tonight is a noir film, it fits all our classic definitions, it's got a happy ending. And uh, I hope I don't give too much away. It's got a happy-ish ending. Um, so even classic noir films that people always hold up, oh, Double Indemnity. Well, that to me had a happy ending. There was a sense of redemption in it. I mean, there was, there was some, you know, the guy admitted that, you know, he'd made mistakes and he was on the road to recovery and becoming a better person. And uh, the Maltese Falcon, which people always say, well, Sam came out all right. And, you know, and so... It wasn't as, I like them really, really, really dark, and uh, I think my favorite for that is Criss Cross, uh, with Burt Lancaster, uh, Yvonne DiCarlo. Uh, in that movie, it just gets worse and worse, and, and then at the last minute when you think, all right, here's, no, nah, it just got worse. <laughs> so I, I guess I, I like those because um, dreary and dark fits my personality. Uh, it, it just, it's so foreign to anything I can imagine, and I just like the, the the willingness to, to not give you the ending you want, to give you the ending that you don't even deserve. Nobody deserves an ending like this. Just take it and be happy. No, you don't need to be happy, just take it. Uh, I, I just sort of like that, that kind of tough approach from directors that they're willing to, to take you to a place and then not bring you back. And as you're looking over the abyss and looking over the edge, they give you a kick and there you go. And, and it just, and I like the ones where you walk out of the theater, for example, recent memory, No Country for Old Men. I saw it at the Little, and at the end of the movie, if, you re if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. We're sitting there, the last scene comes up, the screen goes dark, and the credits start rolling, and we're at the Little, and I just hear somebody go, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you walk out of the movie for days going, maybe there's another reel. <laughs> and, um, and, and those are the kind of movies I like, where there's just, you know, that's it, deal with it. And so when it comes to noir, uh, I like the writers and the movies that, that I, I would never write like that. Well, that's, uh, I have to admit that my new young adult coming out, which is uh, being called by the publisher uh, Young Adult Noir, and it has a dark and it, it starts bad and spirals down, and it, it doesn't get any better. So, uh, oh. <laughs> You're gonna quiz me on it, <laughs> uh, and so it, it does. It does spin down. So I think that's what I like out of the, the things that I read or, or watch. It just gets bad. And what's interesting, you brought up Chris Cross, another favorite of mine, and it ties in perfectly with uh, your next novel. There's a lot of self-determination in that fatality, that that downward spiral. There's a lot of decisions that were made right. to get for the from the main character to get that person to where he's going. It's not necessarily anybody else, else's fault. Right. on his own. Um, uh, just to, to bring everything together, I had this uh, printed up here. I, I got to read uh, his next novel uh, before I quiz him on it. Uh, this, this is a, a, an excerpt from the novel to give you an idea it's of what he does. Right. Start. Ah, it's, very, very, it's the opening. Well, that was going to come. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and that's how the book 
stops. <laughs> You're surprised at all the blood. He looks over at you, eyes wide, mouth dropping open, his face almost as white as his shirt. He's surprised too. There's not a lot of broken glass, though, just some tiny slivers around his feet and one big piece busted into sharp peaks like a spiking line graph, the blood washing down it like rain on a windshield. He doesn't say anything clever or funny, doesn't quote Shakespeare. He just screams, but no one can hear him. It would be too late if they could. You're thinking, this wasn't the way it was supposed to go. This shouldn't be happening. Now things are only going to get worse. And that's how he starts the book. <laughs> um, as long as we're here, uh, let's talk about uh, second person. Uh, a lot of noir is written in first person, and you've taken the decision to work in the second person, calling the, the book you, and putting the reader in the place of the main character. What, what motivated that decision? Okay, there's two answers to this. There is the uh, official answer the publisher likes me to go with, and then there's the insider story that I can only tell for a few more days before the publisher says I have to stop telling it. So you're going to get the The one that, they're, they're, and both of them are true. Both of them are true. Uh, the one story, and, and this is the one that you will hear more often than anything in the, in the reviews and blurbs that are going to come, is that I like the immediacy of it. I like, uh, we don't read books that are in second person, and second person present tense. So there's no past tense. It's going on and you are the character right from the start. The only books we ever read like that, um, well, I didn't read them because they didn't come out until after I was reading them, but those uh, choose your own adventure books where, you know, would you rather go through the window or play with the monkey? And, you know, and you have to pick, and whatever you pick always turns out to be, yeah, oh, that's not a smart idea. Go back and play with the monkey. And, you know, and whatever you do, it always turns out to be good in the end. There's one happy ending for everybody. And there's something fun about those books because you're the hero and it's all about you. So I decided, well, I wanted to, what if you put somebody in the book, and the, this, they're making decisions, but they're not making the decisions. That's pretty much what the character does in the book. Things happen to him. And it's not, he's not a bad kid. He's not a good kid. He's an average kid. And his inability to make a decision, a good decision or a bad decision, is just, well, I don't know what I'll do, so I'll just won't do anything, and everything starts spiraling out of control. That, as a reader, in a second-person book, you have no control. So as the book's going through and saying, you walk in there, you don't talk, it's like, no, talk to your mother, <laughs> say something. But you don't, and the chapter ends, and you're left with this same hopelessness that, ah, oh, there was a missed opportunity. And it builds in the reader that sense of missed chances. And, and as his life spirals down, there's never one big wrong decision he makes. It's just one small omission, one failure to choose, one inexplicable reason why, why didn't you just say something, say anything, and things would have turned out okay. But he doesn't. And I really like that, uh, that immediacy, that, that tension. It was a real challenge as a writer to stay in second person. Because I, I, I don't know, there's probably many writers in the room here, and you find yourself, the character's in your head, or your writing is in your head. So as you're walking through the house later during the day, you'll find yourself saying things like, he opened up the door, looked for the Rice Krispies. They were out. Well, that's okay, there was no milk either. And you find yourself living like, well, try doing that in second person. You're doing it, you're walking down the hall. You're flicking on the light. You realize the light switch isn't working. You know, it's like, stop! <laughs> so it, it gets in your head. So that's, that's the official reason. There's a compelling artistic and literary reason. Uh, and it, it, it's really what motivated me to continue on that way. What made me start that book? I was a drunken bet. Um, I was uh, with a bunch of other mystery writers at a mystery writers convention. And we were sitting around and, and having a few beers at the bar. And, and it got late enough in the evening where we'd gotten off onto weird topics. And one of the guys said, what would be, okay, like the hardest book you'd have to pitch to your, to your agent? The one, I mean, just you, you, your agent wouldn't get it, man. You just, what would be the hardest book you'd have to pitch? And so we're going around the table, and one guy goes, uh, it would be like a coming-of-age gay science fiction western with vampires. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, that, that's good, that's good. So we'll say, no, 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 it would be a memoir written in the future by somebody who's from the past and Napoleon's in it. Okay, all right. And everybody's going around the table trying to one-up each other, and then one person at the table uh, says, uh, no, 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 it'd be a young adult noir written in second person. 
And I don't know if I said, oh, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, but I did re do remember thinking, you know, that actually sounds like interesting. And it didn't, it was enough to get me started on thinking, well, what would a story be like? Would it work? Would it actually be a good idea for a story? But it was only until after I started writing that I realized that the, it, it wasn't a trick, it wasn't a, a technique, it was a real stylistic approach that really pulled me in as an author and would, I knew it pulled in readers as well. So that's, that's what motivated that. And now you can't tell anybody the drunken story. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Just asking my editors in the room first. <laughs> Uh, he'll give you each one a check after. 